today I am being kindly joined by Dennis. If you would uh, kindly excuse bad lighting, this is the only place in the house I have. Um, let's get on. Hello all, my name is Ava and my A-level mocks are just around the corner. I was just revising for history, you know, checking through my notes, revising, and the more notes I read back on about Henry VIII, the more I began to see his side. He wasn't just some greedy little fatty who killed people for the fun of it. He was a boy. He was a man. He had a mission. He had a challenge. And who can fault him for that? So that is why today I will be supporting him so hard that you'd think I were his legs after a large meal. So sit back, relax, and let me reform your opinion on Henry VIII. with his early life, even before Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII was the second son of Henry VII. He was also the second son of Elizabeth of York, the Queen Consort. Now an interesting, more unknown fact about Henry VIII was that he was rumoured to have an Oedipus complex. This means that he was romantically in love with his own mother. Most would find this disgusting, disturbing even, but we all know that the Tudors were known for their conservative ideas. But through a modern lens, we would all consider Henry VIII to be a... Now we all love a good MILF, don't we? Mind you, most wouldn't go for their own mother. But really, Henry launched the trend. Without Henry, we would never have had such people as Kate Blanchett, Angelina Jolie, Gillian Anderson. And what sort of a world would that be? So thank you, Henry VIII. Thank you. My second point now comes to Catherine of Aragon. Since she was just a few years old, she was set to be married to Henry's older brother, Arthur, and this marriage did go through, but unfortunately, not long after, the silly bugger died of tuberculosis. This made Henry first in line for the throne, which meant that he was in desperate need of a wife. Henry's milled mother had also recently died, meaning Henry VII was looking for a woman too. Henry VII found the woman of his dreams, but when he asked her to marry him, she said no. Henry VIII, known to be a uh, mega hottie in his day, asked the same woman to marry him, and she said yes. That woman? Catherine of Aragon. Now Catherine must have been a smoke show, because the House of Tudor wanted her more than they wanted the throne during the Wars of the Roses. But this time, Henry VII just couldn't do it. Henry VIII came, saw, and conquered but he had to wait for his father to die before he could marry her. Another thing Henry did in just the days after Henry VII's death was kill Empson and Dudley. These two were Henry VII's infamous debt collectors, cruel and corrupt to the bone. Henry VIII was clearly gearing up to be the people's princess king. I mean, one of the first demands of your reign to be brutally executing the two greediest men in the country? He basically invented socialism. Well, let's just hope that that was where the killing ended and Henry VIII stays as altruistic as he always was. Henry wasn't just the King of England, he was also the King of Confidence. According to contemporaries, Henry VIII was bloody bodacious, like if Matthew Bainton actually was Charles II. He was over six foot tall, enormous for the era, good looking and uh, I won't say anything about his suit of armour. This therefore grants Henry pretty privilege, meaning anything he does isn't really that bad. Let's be honest, if Anne Hathaway just started slaughtering people left, right and centre, no one would bat an eye. And Henry knew this. A Venetian ambassador once commented that Henry asked him whose cards were better, his or the King of France's. And as you can tell by his portraits, where he definitely has not asked for them to be enlarged, Henry wins. No bloody contests. Henry actually only became famously obese in about 1536 after a jousting incident. But even then, ladies, it's cuffing season, and they didn't have radiators in the Tudor times. My next point is just that Henry is mega relatable. But for me to make my point, we have to rewind a bit. In 1517, Martin Luther hammered in his 95 theses to a door in Germany, thus starting the Reformation as we know it. 
One of these theses was that Christians should not have to take orders from the Pope, but live according to the Bible. Back to 1525, Catherine of Aragon grows old and has so far only given Henry a ginger gal for an heir. Catherine is also becoming menopausal, which, as we all know, is the time when a woman becomes absolutely worthless again. Henry needs to divorce this old hag, but the Pope won't allow it. Something to do with, um, till death do his part, or something like that. So what does Henry do? He adopts Protestant ideology, divorces Catherine, and marries his ex-wife's lady-in-waiting, Anne B. As well as this, he puts a bunch of laws in, dissolves all of the Catholic churches, and changes faith in England as we know it. Now you may be asking, why is this relatable? How is this cool? Let me explain. Now despite everything, the dissolution, the break from the church, everything, Henry VIII was a massive Catholic. He originally changed Protestantism as a threat to see if the Pope would then allow his divorce, but because that never happened, he just kept it that way. It might have been changed back, but Henry just wasn't budging. As well as this, under Catholicism, the hierarchy went God, Pope, and then Henry. And Henry wasn't having any of that, so he changed it. Supreme Head wasn't just what Henry was getting from his mistresses, it's what he became. Supreme Head of the Church of England. If you show me a person who wouldn't do the same, out of spite, pettiness, and for the sake of a power trip, I would show you someone who is about to be beheaded for lying. One thing that we can say about Henry is that he knew what he wanted, and he would stop at nothing to get it. No one wants to be stuck in something they don't like, but it's actually only a small minority of people who do something about it. If Henry didn't like a woman, she'd be gone in an instant. Ladies, if your man ain't treating you right, putting the right sperm in to make the right gender dare, dump him. It's just that Henry took dump for dump her in a grave with two pieces, but it was a mistake. You can't blame the guy for trying. The white police today would never allow someone to do something like that. Henry VII got the vibe. He understood it. He knew that in years to come, every British child would have to learn about him every two years. So why not make sure that his wives were dealt with in a way that made for a catchy rhyme? Divorce beheaded died, divorce beheaded survived. What's a fun and catchy way to remember the order of his wife's tragic fates? Imagine if he did something silly like divorced, annulled, died, divorce beheaded, open relationship. But no, he came and he delivered. Thanks, Henry. Now my final point looks more into the modern day. With a billion and one retellings of the era, we're bound to have some mega hotties playing Henry. But one tops them all. Every British child at some point or another would have seen him on our screens, but he was truly life-changing. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ben Wilborn from Horrible Histories. <laughs> Call me Henry VIII because after that, I'm lost for air. To go over my points again, Henry invented MILFs, backed Catherine of Aragon, killed greedy people, was hot and confident, was the king of petty, knew what he wanted, understood the vibe, and gave us Belle Wilborn. With all those reasons, you can hardly remember that he killed thousands of people for little to no reason. I hope I've radicalised you into the Henry VIII lifestyle after this. Now remember, I'm meant to be revising for my mocks right now, so please like, subscribe and follow my Instagram because I doubt I have my education to fall back on after this. Call me Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard because I'll be heading off. Bye bye. <laughs>